This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. How many of you remember this commercial? I bring you this demonstration for two main reasons. First, it seems that today, more than ever, we have to go way overboard to get people's attention and to say, hey, this is important. People are dying. Second reason, this is considered one of the most memorable anti-drug ads of our time. But was it effective? We have spent more than $33 billion since the 70s in Just Say No ad campaigns directed towards high school students. Now, how much do you believe we have been able to achieve in decreasing drug use in high school students since the 70s? 30%? 20%? 10%? 0%. Welcome to the opioid epidemic conversation. Today, I stand here in front of you for Tony, for Carol, for Amy, and for the thousands of heartfelt grieving parents that have lost a son or a daughter due to an opioid overdose. I stand here for the Williams, the Bakers, and the Patricks, and all of the children that have lost parents due to the scourge of this illness. I stand here for the sisters, the brothers, the relatives, the friends, and the colleagues that have experienced a loss, a death, a finality that takes your energy away and leaves that emptiness, making you wish that you could have done something. In many ways, I am the least likely person to speak on this topic. And yet, in many ways, I am the most uniquely qualified person to speak on this topic. Why least likely? I have never had a drop of alcohol. I have never smoked a puff of anything. I can count the number of times I have taken Advil on one hand. Thankfully, my immediate family is not, is not involved in this grave illness. And we need to be clear, this is an illness. I grew up being showered with love. My family, my parents were not divorced. As far as uniquely qualified, I believe it has to do with the intersectionality of my life. I'm a clinical pharmacist graduating from one of the best pharmacy schools in the country. I'm a leadership results coach, and I own my own company. And I mentor prisoners. I spend an average of 18 to 20 hours a week in meetings where I'm either speaking or listening to other people speak. Why? I have a passion for communication and leadership. You see, any of us can speak, but when you become an effective communicator, you can make miracles happen. A couple of years ago, I received a letter, and it has become part of my life mission. It's where I spend a lot of my time and energy. And it came unexpectedly on a very busy summer day, I had picked up my mail, and I was calling through to pull out the bills because I was leaving on an international trip for two weeks. And this letter caught my eye. It was handwritten. It was from a correctional institution. And when I opened it, it was very long. And it was dealing with what I was doing in public speaking. The inmate was requesting and asking me to open up a public speaking club in prison. And with the help of some friends, not only did we start this one club, 
in less than a year, we started nine. I often joke and say, hey, if we were business, Fortune magazine would be knocking on our door for an interview. And it's what I learned with these inmates, an education that I can get nowhere else, that really brings me to speak with you guys today. I have been told that I'm very analytical. And when I started to practice and read and research and immerse myself in this topic, I set up a couple of Google alerts in, on two terms, opioids and opiates. And if you're wondering what the difference is, an opiate, they can be used interchangeably, is a term that we use for a drug that comes from opium. Opioid is a more common term, and it designates all substances that interact and attach to the opioid receptors in our brain, both natural and synthetic. And as my friends started to hear that I was going to speak on this topic, my inner circle started to grow. First, they started to give me their advice, their opinions, praise. I was told I was courageous to speak on this topic. But this inner circle started to grow. And not only now was I getting my own alerts, but I started receiving emails. I received, started receiving links for articles. I was being notified of documentaries, radio shows. And I was getting offers to even sit in to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. Unsolicited, I started getting requests for interviews, and people such as parents, grandparents, friends, wanted to share their story. But the deepest stories that I heard of pain, rejection, social isolation, and addiction were from the prisoners. You see, many of us want to try to get a hold and grasp this epidemic. And what we know is that the U.S. is the world's leader in opioid prescriptions, and Canada is number two. So how do we get a grasp of it so that we can better understand this epidemic? You see, this is overwhelming. It definitely has the spotlight, and without any exaggeration, we can speak about 50 different talks on this topic. We can speak about the babies that are being born addicted. We can speak about the families that are broken. We can speak about the economic cost of the crisis. We can talk about the new wave of addiction going towards heroin and fentanyl. We can speak about decriminalizing drugs. We can speak about all of the new lawsuits against the pharmaceutical companies. We can also speak about all the initiatives that are underway. There's a lot that is being discussed right now. Awareness is up. But when we start to talk about it, there's certain questions that should come to our mind. Questions like, how did this happen? How do other countries deal with pain and opioids? Who's responsible? If we were going to assign blame, who would we want to blame or need to blame? Who is affected by this epidemic? And what are we doing to fix the problem? But most importantly, what are we not doing that we need to be doing? How did this happen? We need to go back to our own understanding of pain and how we address pain in this country. We need to go back to our own relationship with pills. We need to go back to greed and deception that happened with the pharmaceutical companies, the distributors, the, some in the medical community, and the pill mills. And if you're not familiar with that term, a pill mill is an office, a clinic, where prescriptions for pain meds and narcotics are given unscrupulously it's where you have bad doctors writing prescriptions for narcotics, like candy, not for medical reasons. So how do other countries deal with pain and opioids? Now, that's a fair question. 
And one of the most interesting articles I came across was published September 17, 2017. And I want to quote for you. This is right from Vox, and it was updated by German Lopez. And quoting directly from the article, here's what they say. The biggest misconception is that the U.S. is normal in, in how it handles prescription opioids. So let's compare ourselves to another country. Japan, for example. Older population than us, could be more pain and aches. Universal access to health care, so more opportunity to prescribe. So consider the amount of standard daily doses of opioids consumed in Japan, and then double it, and then double it again, and double it again, double it again, and double it a fifth time. Japan would still come somewhere near second place to the U.S. And finally, every other developed country does at least as good or as a poor job as we do in managing pain, while not using opioids at anywhere near the same level. So that is how other countries are dealing with pain and opioids. Who's responsible? Well, to be fair, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies played hand. We need to know, if we research the history, they misled the country and the world about the safety of their drugs, not showing us that the risks of addiction and abuse were there. We also have the drug distributors. There should have been red flags. If you're distributing millions of pills to a small pharmacy in a small community, something is not right. We also have certain in the medical community that saw an opportunity for quick profits. And I mentioned the pill mills. Back in 2010, Florida was the epicenter of pill mills. 98 out of the 100 top prescribers were in the state of Florida. So let's talk about who is being affected. There are many entry levels into this epidemic. One, you have the patient that goes in for the neck pain, the knee pain, perhaps no medical background. Unsuspectingly, they get their bottle of pain meds, 60-day supply, 30-day supply, and before you know it, they need that medication. They become addicted. You also have the individual that's really trying to escape all the emotional, deep pain that they have, and they turn to drugs painkillers as an opportunity to find that escape, and now they're addicted. Another group would be the young youth who are willing to experiment, and as they're experimenting, they get sucked into this vortex of addiction, and now it's hard to relieve that. Nearly 75 to 80 percent of people that are addicted and have used heroin have started with prescription painkillers. So what are we doing to fix the problem? Good question. And there's lots that's happening all across the country. Those alerts that I was getting, I was looking at lots of great projects, including take back drug days, apps that are being developed, the use of community collaboration. But all of those programs really only touch the surface. And that takes us to, what are we not doing that we need to be doing? And here's what I wanted to open up the conversation. Many of you have heard people say, let the addicts die. Let the inmates rot. Maybe you said it yourself. Today, I want to invite you to come from a different place of humanity, of benevolence, and bring empathy. We have stigmatized addiction because many of us don't understand it as a brain illness. We're still in the mindset of back in the 30s where we consider it to be a lack of character. Addiction is very heartbreaking and very complex. We know that the neural pathways of the brain are changing and it overtakes our brain's natural reward system. So we must come from a different place. And this is the most important thing that I learned in mentoring the inmates. 
when they open up and they begin to share their stories of the deep pain, the rejection, the social isolation, it's a repeating theme. And the most important thing is the human connection. It's caring. And it's letting them tell their story. It's the art of storytelling. See, when we allow them to rewrite their stories or their dreams, it's magical. It's powerful. It's transformational. And they get to share their stories without any judgment, without giving advice. We're giving it to them in a place of trust. Here's a perfect example of a former inmate who we're not going to get a chance to hear his testimony, but told us the same thing of what, what led him from a motorcycle accident all the way to addiction and how he became clean. They say that you have to see or hear something at least nine times for it to even register. So I want you to be looking at the slide and saying it inside your mind, addiction is an illness. Addiction is an illness. Addiction is an illness. That will all help us move forward in how we deal with this epidemic. The opioid epidemic requires several things. One is it requires empathy so that we understand addiction now as a brain illness. No longer do we need to be marking it as a lack of morals and character. We need that human connection. We need to move away from depending always on pills to fix our problems and realize that we, the people, have more power to help each other. We also don't need to only focus on science. We need to focus on kindness. There are two pieces of paper that we can use to overcome this epidemic. One, the prescription pad will help us decrease our supply. But there's another important piece of paper, and it's this. It's being able to take a piece of paper and write your story to have a shared human experience, to know that you can change your beliefs, which will help you change your actions. And I believe one of the best quotes I have seen, and this is a testament of what the prisoners are finding, is that we can take our change by taking our guns for pens, our drugs for responsibility, our violence for order, and our failure for success. I invite you to be part of the solution and move away from it only being a problem. Thank you. <laughs>